Okay, so welcome to this next video on the mitochondria and calcium signaling. So we want to see what is the effect of activating the GQ pathway. And in this example, we activated it through histamine binding to the H1 receptor. We want to see what is the effect of that activation of the GQ pathway, which activates the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. What's its effect on the mitochondria? So for this, we need to look at the concept of a uh, calcium synapse. And I think for this, I'll just get another piece of paper because we need more space than I've got left on this sheet. Okay, so, all right. So uh, the concept of a calcium synapse is that you have a very close contact between the endoplasmic reticulum here. So let's say this is the endoplasmic reticulum lumen here and the mitochondria. So you have potentially your mitochondria sitting here. Right. So there is this close contact between the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria, which sits here. And that contact is known as a calcium synapse because what is going to be transferred from the endoplasmic reticulum to the mitochondria, well, it's not going to be in the case of... Um, uh, neuronal synapses. It's not going to be neurotransmitter. Instead, it's going to be calcium, basically. The ER lumen is basically going to release calcium from its IP3 receptors upon uh, receiving the IP3 signal from the GQ pathway. So, IP3 comes in here. It activates these IP3 receptors here, which then release calcium uh, from the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the um, outer mitochondrial membrane, this membrane here, outer membrane, the outer membrane is freely permeable to calcium, basically. So calcium can go uh, through the outer membrane into the intermembrane space. Now, what will then happen is it will get to the inner mitochondrial membrane. The inner mitochondrial membrane is extremely tight. So uh, this calcium puff that we've released from our um, IP3 receptors here um, is not going to get past the uh, tight uh, inner mitochondrial membrane unless there is some channel in the membrane uh, for calcium to move through. And indeed, there is. So here, there is going to be a channel in this inner mitochondrial membrane, which is known as the mitochondrial calcium uniporter. So this is the mitochondrial mitochondrial uh, calcium uniporter, or the MCU for short. Um, right, so uh, what basically, the, the concept of a calcium synapse then is that you've got this really close contact between the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria, and the transmitter between the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria is going to be calcium. So this basically here is a calcium synapse, a contact between two intracellular organelles that involves calcium as the transmitter molecule, basically. Okay, and remember the mitochondrial calcium uniporter is abbreviated as the MCU. Now, let's have a look in a bit more detail at the structure of this MCU. Right, so the MCU basically consists of two uh, subunits, so it's made up of two proteins. Okay, so I'll divide it into two pieces. So it's made up of two pieces, like so. And uh, these pieces are what are known as the mitochondrial uh, calcium uniporter protein, or the MCU protein. Right, and I will now show you the structure of an MCU protein. So, if this is the phospholipid by there, then the membrane-spanning topology of an MCU protein is as follows. And you have a first membrane-spanning alpha helix, which goes from the intracellular compartment, so this is intracellular, uh, to the extracellular compartment out here. So this is extracellular. So uh, the amino terminus of the polypeptide that makes up this uh, mitochondrial calcium uniporter protein is uh, intracellular, basically. So here is the amino terminus of this polypeptide. Right. It then turns around and has a little sort of loop that dips back into the outer leaflet of this phospholipid bilayer, and then it turns around again 
and then finally does make it back through to the uh, cytosolic um, compartment. So it has two membrane-spanning alpha helices along with a loop in between. And uh, this is basically the membrane-spanning topology of the MCU proteins. It's a polypeptide, and here's the amino terminus, and here's the carboxyl terminus. Both of them are intracellular. So basically, you put two of these together in order to get this mitochondrial calcium uniporter, basically. So when I've labeled that as the MCU protein, I mean, I mean half of it is the MCU protein. The whole channel is the MCU channel, the mitochondrial calcium uniporter. So the entire thing, which I'll now circle in pink, is the mitochondrial calcium uniporter. Okay, right. So mitochondrial calcium uniporter, which I'll just abbreviate to MCU. Right, okay. So um, to make a mitochondrial calcium uniporter, you take two of these two of these proteins, two of these MCU proteins, which I've shown here, and you stick them together. Now, that makes the main pore forming subunit of the MCU channel. Uh, but um, but there are also proteins which modulate the function of the MCU channel, and in particular, they modulate the function of the MCU protein. So, in association with each one of these MCU proteins, is there are then two other proteins. Okay, so I will um, show these. Where shall I show these? Um, I will show these here. So, if we have a single MCU protein here, then there are two proteins basically which modulate the function of um, the um, of this uh, MCU protein here, and they are known as MiQ1 and MiQ2. So, uh, this one is MiQ1 here, MiQ1, and this one here is MiQ2. Right, so uh, MiQ1 and MiQ2 are involved in modulating the function of the MCU channel, basically. And uh, their role is to, um, is to sense calcium level and change whether this MCU protein is open or closed, basically. Right. And uh, they both have on their cytosolic domain. Uh, oh, I just realised I've, I've labelled this completely wrong. I've uh, labelled this as extracellular and intracellular. But we are, of course, talking uh, about uh, a protein that is in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So this should be uh, the matrix side. So on the matrix side of the mitochondria, and this should be the side that faces the intermembrane space. I do apologise for that into membrane space. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, again, we're transferring this uh, drawing down to here. So this is the intermembrane space here, and this is the matrix of the mitochondria here. So, on the side of, um, on the, um, uh, on the intermembrane space side, what you have is two EF hand domains for each of these MiQ proteins. So MiQ2 has two EF hand domains, like so, uh, dimerized together, and MiQ1 also has two EF hand domains, which I'll show like this. Okay, dimerized, so it has an EF hand dimer. Now, just to remind you what an EF hand is, an EF hand is basically a calcium binding domain. So an EF hand is what we're discussing. An EF hand is a special type of calcium binding domain that is made up, um, well, it's a polypeptide, basically. It's made by a polypeptide. So you basically have the polypeptide coming down and forming a loop, like so. And the calcium will bind in this loop. So calcium ions can bind in here in the EF hand loop, like so. And uh, the reason the calcium can bind in the EF hand like so is because the amino acids that make up um, this polypeptide on this ring here, they all have acidic residues. You have loads of acidic amino acids, acidic amino acids, okay? And basically, these acidic amino acid uh, groups uh, can uh, donate their protons away because they're acidic. Uh, so they donate their uh, protons, and then when they donate their protons, they have lost a positive charge, which means that they have now have a negative charge, basically, because they were neutral, they've given away their protons, so they are going to end up being negative.
So, you end up with a huge number of amino acids with negative charges on this polypeptide loop here. And those negative charges all face into this loop and they can coordinate a calcium uh, divalent cation here. So this is a calcium cation. Okay, now EF hand domains, which are these sort of loops of polypeptides, they can occur on their own, but often you see them in dimers. So you see one EF hand domain, like so, with a linker, which then goes into the next EF hand domain. So often you see dimers of EF hand domains, and then what will happen is that two calcium ions will overall bind to this EF hand dimer, one in each of these two loops. So this is an EF hand dimer. Okay, so both these proteins, MICU1 and MICU2, so I'll give them a nice colour. So MICU2 I've coloured in green, and uh, MICU1 I'll colour in uh, red. Okay, so here's MICU1. Both of them have two uh, extracellular calcium, well, sorry, no, intermembrane space facing uh, calcium sensing domains. They have these dimers of EF hands, uh, which can bind calcium. So basically, when, uh, when there is no calcium present, so let's say when there's very, very low calcium in this intermembrane space, so let's say the calcium concentration is at the normal uh, cytosolic level, so it's, let's say, 100 nanomolar, because I told you that the outer membrane is freely permeable to calcium. So if the cytosolic concentration of calcium is 100 nanomolar, it will mean that the intermembrane space's calcium concentration is roughly around 100 nanomolar as well. Okay, so let's say calcium is at that low level in the intermembrane space, then uh, there won't be any calcium bound to these EF hand dimers of the MICU1 and MICU2 proteins. Okay, and when that is the case, when there's no calcium bound to that EF hand dimers, then the activity of MICU2 is to inhibit the mitochondrial calcium uniporter protein. So this is the MCU protein here. Okay, and MICU2 is going to make it more likely that the MCU channel, this mitochondrial calcium uniporter here, it's going to make it more likely that the mitochondrial calcium uniporter is closed, okay, and therefore is not conducting calcium into uh, the matrix of the mitochondria, okay? Right, so that's when there's low calcium in the intermembrane space. Now let's say calcium goes up in the intermembrane space. If calcium goes up in the intermembrane space, then you're going to get calcium ions binding in these two calcium binding domains of these EF hand dimers. So two calciums bind to MICU2, two calciums bind to MICU1. And when that happens, MICU2 loses its function. It stops inhibiting the MCU protein. So it stops trying to make the MCU channel closed, basically. And also, when calcium binds to the EF hand dimers of MICU1, MICU1 gains an activity and it activates the MCU protein. So it makes it more likely that the MCU protein is going to adopt an open conformation. So it makes it more likely that the MCU channel, the mitochondrial calcium uniporter, is going to uh, be open. So, the point of this entire discussion is to say that when you get a calcium puff in this calcium synapse, then calcium is going to go up n in this uh, intermembrane space nearby the calcium synapse. And that calcium is going to bind to MICU1 and MICU2, and is going to inactivate MICU2 and activate MICU1. MICU1 will then activate the mitochondrial calcium uh, uniporter protein, the MCU protein, and is going to make the MCU channel open, basically. So MCU channel here is going to open. Now, it's called the mitochondrial calcium uniporter for a reason. It can only conduct calcium in a single direction, which is into the matrix. Now, if the calcium uh, gradient across the mitochondrial membrane favours the movement of calcium in, then the MCU will conduct calcium into the channel. If it doesn't favour uh, calcium movement in, i.e. let's say some bizarre situation meant that the mitochondrial matrix had a much higher calcium concentration in the intermem out intermembrane space, uh, you would not get the movement of calcium out through this channel because it is a uniporter. It only conducts it in a certain direction.
Okay, but in this case, the calcium is going to be far higher in the intermembrane space than it is in the matrix. So the mitochondrial calcium uniporter will then conduct calcium into the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay, so you've now got calcium in the matrix of the mitochondria. That calcium in the matrix of the mitochondria is going to uh, take part in many different signaling pathways. For instance, what it will lead to, one of the things it will lead to, is it will increase respiration. So respiratory rate uh, will go up, basically. Respiratory rate will go up, and you will produce more ATP, basically. So that's one of the many functions of uh, calcium level in the, um, in the matrix of the mitochondria. Now, an important point to note is that this mitochondrial calcium uniporter, in vitro, what we find is that this only is going to conduct calcium into the matrix of the mitochondria if the concentration of calcium in this intermembrane space is around one millimolar. Now, global calcium concentration in the cytoplasm should never ever get to the height of one millimolar. That would kill the cell, basically. But, what? so that's a, an odd thing, that this channel is only going to function at one millimolar. And initially, people used to think that this channel, its role was only in pathological circumstances, because only in pathological circumstances would calcium levels ever get to that height. But the reality is that because of these calcium synapses, because of these very close contact between the IP3 receptor and the MCU, then the calcium's all being rushed out of this IP3 receptor from the ER lumen. And very locally, in the vicinity of that MCU, calcium concentration will get up to one millimolar. So even though the global calcium concentration is never, ever going to get to one millimolar, locally, because of the local interaction of this calcium synapse, you will get to that, that sort of height of calcium level, basically, within uh, the neighborhood of this mitochondrial calcium uniporter. And therefore, you do get calcium conductance through the MCU into the mitochondrial matrix, and its effect is to increase respiratory rate.